in this episode of Influencers, Hermitage Capital Management CEO, Bill Browder. Are we ready to go to war? Is the United States ready to go to war with Russia? I think that, that this is gonna to lead to a Russian depression. I, 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 I can't imagine the strangle, how the stranglehold doesn't, doesn't really drive the GDP down like 20%, 25%. It's, it's remarkable. And we're just in the in the early stages of this game. The Ukrainians are not gonna uh, are not gonna roll over. They're gonna fight like hell. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Bill Browder, CEO at Hermitage Capital and head of the global Magnitsky Justice Campaign. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, Browder's firm delivered stellar returns by exposing corruption at major Russian companies, bringing about company shakeups and boosting share prices. In 2005, Browder was denied re-entry to Russia and later became a victim of a Russian government scheme to undermine his firm, he says. Sergei Magnitsky, a lawyer hired by Browder to investigate Russian corruption, was arrested and died in Russian custody. Bill, welcome to Influencers. Thank you so much for joining us. Great to be here. Um, so much to get to uh, right now. I, I want to ask you maybe first of all about Vladimir Putin. And have you ever seen uh, Putin reverse course in 25 years of watching him closely? Can you see him changing his tack now in Ukraine uh, now that he's committed to a full scale invasion? That's a really, this, that's the most important question of, of our discussion. And the answer is a definitive no. Vladimir Putin can't you have to imagine his, his world is the world of a prison yard in a prison yard you can't show any weakness um if someone comes at you with a shank you got to shank them 10 times more and look around at everyone else and say who else wants to be shanked that's that's vladimir putin's mindset that's how he operates and so when he has embarked on this on this horrific military uh invasion it's there. There's no chance. Anytime he announces peace talks, that's just a tactic to either split up the resolve of the West or to delay some action to resupply or something like that. And so he is going to move forward. He's going to escalate. There's no retreat. There's no compromise. There's no diplomacy. He's all in it for, for victory, however he defines that. And so a lot of people use this phrase end game, Bill, but, but I'll ask you, I mean, what is the end game here specifically with Ukraine first? And does he want to occupy it or, or how would this work in his mind? Well, this is a really a, another important part of Vladimir Putin. Um, he, there, there is no end game. So what you have to understand is he is not there for all the reasons that he says he's there. You can't believe a word he says. He's, a, he's an inveterate liar. Um, his credibility is zero. And so any words that he has used to describe what he's doing should be discounted. The reason that he is in Ukraine is because after 22 years as a dictator, he, see, he sees the writing on the wall. He sees the writing on the wall, meaning that uh, the Belarusian uh, dictator next door was over, almost overthrown 18 months ago by his people. The Kazakh dictator, again, and next door in a different direction, was overthrown. And Putin realized that it was just a matter of time before the Russians overthrew him. And so pulling straight out of the dictator's playbook 101, he, um, he said, what do you do to not get overthrown? You start a war. And uh, He's described you know, Ukrainians as Nazis and drug dealers, and he's described NATO as an invading force and all sorts of things. He doesn't believe any of that. He's just trying to come up with a narrative to give the Russian people something to chew on um, in order for him to have a war, and his war is there to stay in power. And so when you say, what is his end game? It, it, there is no end game. His end game is to go move forward, to expand, to attack, to, to take territory, to declare victories. But he has to keep on going, no matter what it is, and and this is just part of that process. And it and it and it's not like it just started now. I mean, the most recent version of this just started now. 
he was feeling under pressure in 2008, and that's when he invaded Georgia. In 2014, the same thing. He took Crimea. And so this is, this is a, a long process of him trying to stay in power as a dictator. And the most scary part of this whole uh, story is that I don't have any belief that he, he will stop. So let's just say that, that he's successful in Ukraine. And, and that's a very big question because the Ukrainians are valiantly fighting back. But let's say he was successful in Ukraine. That's not the end of his story. He would then go to other countries, maybe the easy ones, maybe the hard ones, maybe he grabs Moldova at some point. But his, his, the ultimate uh, goal for him is to show up at, at, at the border with us, which means Estonia or Latvia or Lithuania or Poland. And then to test out something that has never been tested before, which is, are we ready to go to war? Is the United States ready to go to war with Russia to protect Estonia, a country of a million people that, no, that probably you know, 2% of Americans could locate on a map? Are we ready to do that or are we not? And, he, and he's taken the bet right. that, we're, that we're not. But, but isn't this going to be very difficult for him just to hold on to this real estate? I mean, look at Afghanistan, very different country certainly, but look at Afghanistan under Brezhnev. I mean, there's a huge cost to occupying these, these countries, right? Absolutely. So, so I was just saying, I, I, was, I was saying that's his assumption, is just keep on pushing out. Now, let, let's talk about Ukraine specifically. So he's launched an invasion of Ukraine. We don't know the exact number of casualties, but um, I've read various reports to say that there's 3,000 soldiers have been killed in the first four days of, of their occupation. I don't know if that's true or not. Maybe it's wildly exaggerated. Maybe it's totally true. But let's just say for a, let's just take for a moment and say it is true. That's the total number of soldiers that died in the entire war with Chechnya. That's, mm -hmm. that's like a third or a, between a quarter and a third of the number, total number of soldiers that died after nine and a half years in Afghanistan. And so he's paying a hefty price. Um, even if it's just a fraction of the 3,000, he's still paying a hefty price for what he's done so far. And we're just in the in the early stages of this game. The Ukrainians are not gonna uh, are not gonna roll over. They're gonna fight like hell. Um, thankfully, now uh, after some some resistance, uh, all of the major Western allies are going to assist them with equipment to help them fight and and give them some decent chance. But at the end of the day, Vladimir Putin is way outgunned them. I mean, he's got all sorts of stuff. Right. There was, uh, I mean, shocking. Um, military hardware that could really, you know, be unbelievably destructive in, in, to people in Ukraine. On the other hand, Bill, it, it appears, or one could argue, that the Ukrainians are winning the war of social media. Um, and, and I'm wondering if Vladimir Putin, who supposedly was this expert in disinformation <laughs> in social media, has underestimated um, the Ukrainians' abilities there. Well, so uh, the Ukrainians have had some help, and um, as critical as I am on, on some aspects of um, U.S. foreign policy, the Biden administration has done a fantastic job early on of sharing intelligence about what the Russians were up to and repeating it and repeating it and repeating it. So by the time the Russians invaded, there was no alternative narrative. So the way the Russians normally do this, and they did this with Georgia, for example, there was like confusion to this day about who fired first in Georgia and the Russian apologist said, well, it was the Georgians who pre precipitated and provoked this war and so on and so forth. There's no uncertainty about this. This was a war of aggression. And that's a very important term. A war of aggression is a term they use in the Nuremberg trials. This is a war of aggression that everybody can agree on. And so there's nobody who can, can uh, no, no sort of natural Russian apologist, nobody who's got a lot of financial interest with Russia who can say anything other than this was a, a, a brazen attack on a peaceful neighbor. And that's an extremely important part of the narrative that, that has allowed um, all the Western countries to lock arms and do the, do the, the coordinated sanctions that, are, that have been done right now, which are causing enormous financial pain to Vladimir Putin. Yeah, let's drill down into that, Bill, sanctions. How effective are they right now? And what, you know, what grade would you give them, for instance? And what do we need to do from here? So I'm, I'm a sort of connoisseur of sanctions if such a thing exists. And so when they first started this sanctions program about a week ago, last Tuesday, I would have given the Western governments a two out of 10. It was all very, you know, too little, too late. Um, then the atrocities started to happen and, and the sanctions started getting real when they added the major Russian banks, um, uh, um, the, uh, big oil companies, et cetera. By Thursday, it was an eight out of 10. Then they did SWIFT, 
um, uh, that's a nine out of 10. Uh, and then they did Vladimir Putin um, and nine and a half out of 10. So there's still some, some gaps that need to be filled in. Uh, SWIFT is only done, so SWIFT means disconnecting the um, uh, Russian banks from the international financial system, and they've only done 70% of the banks. And so logic would tell you that if 70% of the banks are disconnected, they'll just route all the payments through the 30% of the banks that aren't disconnected. That's just <laughs> what anyone would do, and certainly the Russians will do that. And so we need to sanction the other 30% of the banks. And a lot of people ask me, why, why, why are those banks protected? And I can imagine that there was some you know, ugly backroom deal with, you know, in a smoky room where somebody said, we have an interest there, don't do that. But th so those other 30% of the banks need to be uh, sanctioned, uh, disconnected from SWIFT. And then the, the most important part of the whole exercise is that Vladimir Putin's own money needs to be hit. And his own money is held not by himself, but by oligarchs who look after it. And so we need to freeze the assets of the oligarchs in the West. And a lot of announcements have been made that that's, that's the intention. A few oligarchs have, ad, have been added to the various EU, US, UK sanctions lists. Um, but that needs to be done in a much more coordinated manner because the, there's different oligarchs in the US that have been sanctioned in the EU and different ones in the EU than the UK. And then a list needs to be expanded dramatically. So there's 50 or 60 or 100 of the most wealthy oligarchs in Russia sanctioned. And if yeah, we get right. the... God, let me interrupt. I'm sorry, Bill, but practically speaking, how would that be accomplished? Isn't that extremely difficult? You've got Caymans and you know countries like that, and I don't mean to disparage them specifically. There are all sorts of money havens around the world. Never mind <laughs> Switzerland, which has said that actually they're they're up against Russia at this point. But how would that be done practically? Well, it's, it's actually not as complicated as you think. So, the, the, so it's not the government's job to necessarily track down the assets. So what, what happened, the way it works in, in practical terms is a person gets added to the sanctions list. Once they're on the sanctions list, then it's the job or the responsibility, not the job, but the legal responsibility of a bank that holds their money to no, no longer transact with that person. So that money gets frozen or a real estate agent not to, not to sell their property or a broker not to sell their shares. And at that point, everything gets frozen. And so it effectively gets crowdsourced. Now, you, you, you made a good point, which is, you know, let's say their stuff is not in the United States or in the UK, but in the Cayman Islands. Well, guess what? The Cayman Islands is, is a um, crown dependency. Um, uh, the, uh, and, and as a result, every one of these um, Guernsey, Jersey, the Isle of Man, Cayman Islands, British Virgin Islands, they copy the British sanctions list. And so you, you end up in a situation where where uh, whatever Britain does, all these offshore jurisdictions do. And so Britain is really punching way above its weight in terms of its importance in this, in this whole scheme. And so just coming back to the original thought, you put a person on the sanctions list, they get sanctioned everywhere, Cayman Islands, BBI, UK. And if all the countries coordinate, then there's really no civilized place they can hide. Now, we, we're, we're seeing oligarchs scrambling right now, moving yachts. I read a story about one oligarch who's parked his yacht in Saudi Arabia. OK, because he doesn't think that, that the Saudi Arabians will freeze his yacht. And, and there are stories about mad scrambles of oligarchs trying to sell properties, give them away to family members and getting divorced from their wives and giving them property, all sorts of interesting stuff. Um, and that will happen. And, and, and they will probably succeed in protecting some of their assets. But even if you don't get all their assets, just having a, a person on the sanctions list means that they're no longer that they're, they're pretty much out of the game. They're benched. In the world, right. in the international financial world, another remarkable development, or correct me if if you think I'm wrong, Bill, is the is the response by the private sector, both in Europe and in the United States. I mean, everything from Disney to Shell to the banks um, curtailing or ending their financial relationships with Russia. What do you think about that, and is this effective? Well, in a certain way, I would almost argue it's more effective because, okay, so the, you know, the sanctions lists are important, government activity is important, but if every Western company stops doing business with the Russians, it's, it's, um, it's really dramatic. Um, I, I, I remember when I started my whole uh, campaign for justice for Sergei Magnitsky, my murdered lawyer, uh, one of the first people, people I met with, I was, I was um, in South Africa and I met with a a woman named Helen Zilli, who was one of the people involved in the, um, uh, one of the main people involved in the anti-apartheid movement. I'd watched a, a movie called Cry Freedom, and, sh and she was one of the characters in the movie. And I, 
And I met with her shortly after Sergei Magnitsky was murdered and we talked and we talked about how they ended apartheid. And she said, it was all about disinvestment. It was all about the US and Western Europe disinvesting from South Africa, that when they became financially isolated, that's when it became too much. And so I think this is really, really important. And I think this is probably, you know, as I look at the next steps, what can we do next when we watch these atrocities unfold in Ukraine? I think it's just to, to pressure every single Western business to divest, to stop doing business, to stop supplying goods, to stop supplying services to Russia. Right. Are, are the sanctions enough to send the Russian economy into a recession? And is this an objective that we should try to achieve even? Well, if you had asked me two months before this whole thing had started, I would have said, let's just go after the oligarchs and leave the Russian people alone. We have got no beef with the Russian people. They didn't do anything. They don't, they, most Russian people don't want this. I would, say, I would say the vast majority don't want this. They don't want to send soldiers into harm's way to be killed and mangled. They don't want to have to pay 100% more for food and imports, um, which they're not even going to get anymore. No more imports. Um, I think the average Russian person doesn't want this. And, and so I wish that, that we had done this before, which and possibly... Um, you know, sent Putin a message how costly this would be in a real way that he wouldn't understand it. So he, he wouldn't have invaded, but we, we, he has invaded. And so now we have to say, okay, what's the strategy going forward? And the strategy has to be to raise the price as high as possible. And most importantly, to just deplete Vladimir Putin of resources so that this war becomes so expensive and he just doesn't have the money because the central bank reserves are frozen. The um, uh, uh, exports are, are not generating any, any income. Um, no more foreign direct investment at all. And so we're in a situation where, where he just can't afford it anymore. What would it take to remove Vladimir Putin from power? Um, not maybe the United States or MI6 or the CIA directly, but say the people around him. How could that unfold possibly? Well, I mean, everybody I know calls me up and says, how's that gonna happen? And I, and I say, it's not gonna happen. Um, it, it, it's, it's remarkable how, how um, uh, you know, <clears throat> he um, he's got this you know thirty foot table that he sits far away from everybody else. He he he's so paranoid. He's so worried about um, treachery and and disloyalty, and he's such a disloyal person himself that um, there, there's nobody who's gonna ever get close to um, killing him or you know palace coup type of thing. Uh, it's just not going to happen. And so um, I, I think the way that this thing. Um, the, the most likely way that, that we stop him is just that he runs out of resources, that it just becomes, you know, he just doesn't have any money and no one's lending it to him and he's not earning it. And all the stuff he has both um, at the central bank is frozen and with the oligarchs offshore is frozen. And, he, and it just can't afford to do it anymore. You physically can't afford it. One thing that I'm curious about is after the oil companies, BP and Shell and others said they'd exit from Russian investments, Russia imposed a temporary ban on foreign investors selling their Russian assets. First of all, how can they how can they do that? I mean, I guess you could just say, I don't want them anymore. You could give them away. Or, and, and what's your reaction to this, man? How does this work? Can you explain this to us? Well, I don't think anyone knows how it works. Uh, I, well, first of all, what I can tell you is that um, everybody who's, you know, the Norwegian pension fund is going to sell their assets and and probably, you know, 50 other pension funds as well. And and the index, like the MSCI index, probably won't include Russia anymore, and so all index funds will sell their their shares. Uh, and so the only people that will buy these shares will be Russians buying them at ninety five percent down. And so um, I mean there'll be there'll be some Russians that are going to make a bet and uh, uh, the, the buy the stuff you know ninety five percent down and then hold it for some period of time and hope that Putin disappears and that there's a you know uh, detente and and. You know, the world comes back to normal and then they can make 20 times their money. That, that's probably what will happen with these shares and these interests. You've been following him, uh, him being Putin at, at odds with him, fighting against him for many, many years, Bill. Is this a sea change moment, very different from anything you've ever seen before? How would you characterize this time? Well, what, what he's doing is exactly in character. I mean, look, he invaded Ukraine, he took Crimea, shooting down passenger planes, sending out assassins across England and other countries. This is all just par for the course. The sea change is how the West has reacted. That's the sea change. Uh, the sea change is, is Germany saying that they're going to diversify away from Russian gas and stop the Nord Stream pipeline, supply 
military equipment build up their uh, defense. Um, it's, you know, a Maersk saying no more, we're not going to deliver any more ships to, or uh, containers or take containers from Russian ports. It's BP saying that they're going to sell their stake in Rosneft. That's the sea change. It's, it's, and that's the thing that I think he totally didn't expect. And the other sea change is that, you know, he rolled across Crimea pretty easily because there was no, nobody there to, to fight him. And Georgia wasn't, wasn't so difficult, but the Ukrainians are fighting back. And right. uh, they're fighting back hard, and 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 making him look weak, and and, um, and that that's kind of interesting and horrifying because a weak Putin or, or a Putin that's perceived to be weak is one is a perception he can't afford, and so he's going to have to do a lot of really awful stuff not to look weak, and that's going to and I, I pray for the Ukrainians what what's what's going to happen next. I, I guess a cornered rodent metaphor. Uh, maybe comes to mind at that point. Um, well, I'm wondering I just, about. I, I just said a corner rodent where he put himself in that corner. We none of us put him in that corner. He did it. Him, did it himself. Fair enough. I, I'm wondering if there's any way to get at the the thinking of CEOs of top Russian companies. You know, in the environment that they're in right now, the situation they're in. How frustrated. Are they with Putin or are they in lockstep? And do they have any recourse here? Well, um, they're all just cursing because, you know, P Putin's promise to them at the very beginning of his presidency is, you know, I'm gonna, no more chaos. It was chaotic before Putin. Yeltsin, the previous president, um, uh, governed with hyperinflation, with de debt defaults, with horrifying uh, standard of living. And Putin came in and said, I'm going to make everything predictable. And we're all going to make a lot of money. That was his big pitch to everybody, and um, and 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 also he said, and and you have to have me because uh, anyone else there'll be chaos again, and and so to the extent that 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 his presidency requires support from anybody, and I'm not sure it really does anymore. I think it's you know it doesn't really matter what people think of him, but to the extent that that people um, it, to the extent it does matter, people are furious. I mean, if you're uh, a multi-billionaire Russian oligarch, you know, you, you were living living large, you know, with yachts and right. airplanes and villas and paparazzi and football teams. And, and all of a sudden, you know, you're considered to be, you know, associated with a war criminal now right, <laughs> and right. having your assets frozen. I mean, nobody can can possibly support that. And the Russian people can't support that either, because now all of a sudden, you know, Russia, you mentioned the word earlier in our conversation, recession. I think that, that this is going to lead to a Russian depression. I, 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 I can't imagine the strangle, how the stranglehold doesn't, doesn't really drive the GDP down like 20%, 25%. It's, it's remarkable, all, all the steps that are being taken right now. And one of the strongest, if not the strongest sectors of the Russian economy is energy, oil and gas. And we've talked a little bit about how the Western energy providers and companies uh, have been um, taking up against uh, actions against Russia, looking to sell their assets, et cetera. But I'm wondering, should the West cripple Russia's energy sector? Is that a good idea to do so? Well, I, I, so, so, so the main reason that we're doing any of this stuff is to deplete his resources so he doesn't have the finances to continue his military expansion. And therefore, if that's the objective, then we should cripple any resource he has that generates cash. And it's going to be a hard, it's going to be a tough balancing act because 40% of, of German households rely on Russian gas, 100% of Italian households, 100% of Austrian households. And so how, do, how, do, how does a country diversify away from, from that type of uh, exposure, that type of concentration? It doesn't happen. You can't, you can't make a decision and say, tomorrow we're going to buy gas from the Qataris. You need like ports and and pipelines and all sorts of other stuff. And so, you know, I, I think, you know, he's kind of, uh, and he, he knew this, he kind of ha has us in a stranglehold, which is why the, the energy sector has been more or less left untouched. Now, I don't think that that's going to be a permanent situation. I think that now you're going to see massive, accelerated, strategic diversification going on. But, but for the most, for, for the time being, you know, the lights will go out in Germany and Italy if, if, um, if they stop supplying gas. You know, I should point out that that the the likelihood of Russia stop supplying gas, stopping supplying gas, is relatively low, at least over a reasonable period of time. 
because that's where they get the money from. So, right. you know, they, they, they might be able to like turn, you know, make Germans cold for a few weeks, but um, longer than a few weeks, uh, they're, they're, they quickly run out of money and they've already run out of money. Right. Crypto exchanges, including Coinbase and Binance, have reportedly rejected a request by Ukraine to freeze all Russian accounts. Is that a step that these exchanges should take? Yeah, they should be shut down by the by, by the by the Western European and U.S. And, and U.K. regulators if they don't step in and do this. I mean, it, it's for them to to be accomplices to uh, to Russia's uh, sanctions evasion is a is a serious you know blow to world security. What about China and all this, Bill? I mean, you hear that uh, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin are very much on the same page. On the other hand, last week uh, she looked like he was criticizing Putin a little bit. It's unclear though. And doesn't Xi Jinping have a lot of leverage here? Well, I mean, he, he's the lender of last resort if, um, if uh, now that, that the West has completely cut off Russia from the financial markets. And so Putin is gonna have to go begging for money. And I think the Chinese will provide money on highly usurious terms. <laughs> It'll be like borrowing money on a credit card. I'm sure the Chinese will say, yeah, I think we can help you out. 19.78%, um, thank you very much. And by the way, we want the um, such and such as collateral, you know, and take some huge infrastructure as collateral. Um, th there's one interesting angle to the China thing that, that's worth pointing out, um, which is not so much who's allied with who, but the Chinese are equally um, malicious actors in the world. And the, the coordinated financial um, attack that the West has executed against Russia, I think is so scary that the Chinese probably won't, if they were eyeing up Taiwan to do something similar, I think they'll put that on the back burner. Right. I, I want to get to your personal background a little bit, Bill. I have a fascinating story. We talked about it a little bit with your firm and, and all of your trials and tribulations in, in Russia investing there. Um, after your ordeal battling the government in Russia, you became a global champion of the Magnitsky Act, which allows the U.S. and other countries to sanction foreign officials involved in human rights abuses validating or infuriating to see the need for such laws at a time like this? Um, uh, both, <laughs> but, but, but most interestingly, so we, we, the Magnitsky Act works for human rights abusers and corrupt officials. It was passed in 2012 and it, and, and it completely blew, Putin blew his top when he, when he saw this happen. And I mean, really just like, I mean, in, in, in the most emotional way, he banned the adoption of Russian orphans by American families in retaliation. And the, and the orphans that were being adopted were the sick ones, the ones who were not well. And Americans would still take these children back to America and nurse them to health. And they tended to die in the orphanages. So he is effectively sentencing orphans to death in his own country as a retaliation against the Magnitsky Act. And everybody was scratching their heads and saying, why is this guy reacting so harshly? And the reason is we can see it today, literally today, which is that this was the basis for which all of future sanctions were, were modeled on, asset freezes and travel bans. And every, so every person that's now gonna be sanctioned will basically be sanctioned on the basis of the Magnitsky Act. And the reason he was so upset was because he knew, he's not stupid, he knew that eventually the Magnitsky Act would come for his money. And so there's a direct line between <laughs> the murder of Sergei Magnitsky, my campaign for the Magnitsky Act, the sanctions that were put in place, and the sanctions that are now gonna um, go after Putin's money. In 2018, Putin mentioned you by name during a press conference with then President Trump, offering to allow US investigators to interview 12 Russian intelligence agents identified by Robert Mueller's probe in exchange for allowing Russian intelligence to question you and others close to you. Trump later called it an incredible offer. What is your view of the way Trump reset U.S. relations with Russia, and do you think it affects the way the world approaches Russia today? Well, thankfully, I think that the Trump situation was an aberration. Not, I don't think it was like a, a permanent damage to the uh, relations between the United States and the rest of the world, and, and I don't think it, it, it certainly hurt the U.S. credibility for a short period of time, but we can see right now in the multilateral approach towards sanctioning Russia that things continue to work as they should. I mean, it's pretty horrifying 
the idea that an American president would hand over <laughs> me and a bunch of US government officials to Putin um, because Putin asked for that. I mean, it's just unbelievable, really. And, um, and it also seems pretty unbelievable. It took him four days to walk it back. And it was only after the Senate planned, uh, had a vote um, whether or not to hand us over. And they voted 98 to zero. About 20 minutes before the vote, Trump, uh, through his press secretary, declined Putin's offer. But um, uh, if Trump had been reelected, so that, that was during the Mueller probe. <laughs> so if, uh, <clears throat> and so he was sort of under the spotlight as far as Russia goes. If he was reelected, I wouldn't have been able to travel back to the United States because surely he would have handed me over to Putin. And so uh, I, I, from a personal safety standpoint, I, I breathed an enormous sigh of relief when he was defeated. And final question, Bill, going forward, what sort of work do you see yourself doing and what sort of legacy do you see yourself leaving? Well, the legacy that I've, I'm in the process of leaving is a legacy where Sergei Magnitsky's name is on legislation, not just in the United States, but now in 34 countries um, sanctioning human rights abusers, not just in Russia, but all over the world. And so the Magnitsky Act now applies to Chinese officials involved in the uh, uh, genocide in, in Xinjiang, is involved in, it, it sanctions uh, Iran, Iranians, Myanmar officials, uh, all sorts of bad actors all over the world. And, and, and it creates a big disincentive to human rights abusers and, and to kleptocrats. And, and it also creates some redress for victims. And, and uh, you know, for me, the, the Sergei Magnitsky's murder is a, is a uh, burden of burden of guilt that I carry with me everywhere because he, he was my responsibility and he was killed in my service. And, and so every day that I do something to enhance his legacy and to um, do that in a way that potentially will offer other victims redress and save lives is, is sort of my project. And I, uh, as, as more and more countries do this, then the next step is to have more and more countries use the Magnitsky Act against bad actors. And so um, Sergei Magnitsky will, from, from the grave and from heaven, be helping everybody else out in their terrible moments of distress. Bill Browder, CEO of Hermitage Capital Management and head of the Global Magnitsky Justice Campaign. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. If you've been watching Influencers, I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.